Good afternoon. Welcome to the Best Practices in Family Treatment Drug Court webinar sponsored by SAMHSA and the SAMHSA Gain Center. I'm Dan Abril and I will moderate this webinar. Family treatment drug courts have been around since the late 90s and estimates put the number of federal treatment drug courts at over 300 nationwide. Growing out of the drug court model, these courts address substance use, child welfare, and criminal behavior within the family system. Evaluation and research data now inform expansion and improvement of these courts. We highlight three exceptional family treatment drug courts today, and I will introduce the presenters shortly. But first, some logistics. The views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, please, uh, there will be uh, questions uh, entertained at the end of the three presentations. Please submit your questions to, to the presenters in the question and answer pod on your screens. The presenters will address as many questions as time permits at the end of the presentations. I'll do my best to sort them out and assign them to appropriate people or our presenters will volunteer to respond to the questions. This is the agenda for today. Uh, following uh, my remarks, we'll turn it over to John Berg to, to have some open re remar opening remarks on behalf of SAMHSA, and then we'll have presentations by Thompson County Family Treatment Drug Court, the Best Practices in Family Treatment Drug Court in Alameda County, and Travis County Partnership and Recovery Program, uh, following which we'll, we'll do the questions. I'd like, um, so at this point, I'd like to turn the um, webinar over to John Berg, Senior Public Health Advisor from SAMHSA for some opening comments and then I'll introduce the panelists. Thank you, Dan. Uh, welcome everyone to today's webinar, Best Practices in Family Treatment Drug Courts. We appreciate you taking the time to participate in today's informative webinar. SAMHSA is committed to improving prevention, treatment, and recovery support services for mental and substance use disorders. We are dedicated to providing communities, clinicians, policymakers, drug court teams, and others in the field with the information and tools they need to incorporate evidence-based practices into their communities, clinical settings, and drug courts. We also recognize that the science and evidence base continues to expand and change in some fields, including family treatment drug courts. Therefore, it is important to make available and present the evidence-based practices that exist and share best practices that family treatment drug courts are developing to improve the field. Family treatment drug courts take an integrated approach to working with people who have mental and substance use disorders and involvement with the child welfare system. In this webinar, representatives from three family treatment drug courts will share strategies to achieve improved outcomes through specialized courtroom design, programming to support family engagement, relationships with partner agencies, and data collection to inform decision making. Implementing best practices is important for family treatment drug courts to effectively serve active clients through effective treatment services that promote successful family preservation and reunification. We have a diverse panel of presenters with a wealth of knowledge, experience, and expertise working with family drug courts. I want to thank the presenters today and the Gain Center staff for their efforts to pull this webinar together and their ongoing commitment to provide such practical and quality resources like this webinar to improve the criminal justice field. At this time, I will turn it back to Dan Abreu. Thanks, Dan. Okay. Thank you, John. So, um, I'll be introducing the presenters now. Um, first, I'll introduce uh, the presenters from Tom, Tompkins County. Uh, judge John Rowley has served as Tompkins County Court Judge, Family Court Judge, and surrogate since 2000. He, is, he has served as an acting Supreme Court Justice since 2003, presiding over an integrated domestic violence part. He's responsible for criminal court, family court, and surrogate court caseloads. He presides over two specialty courts, which he founded the Family Treatment Court and the Sexual Offender Compliance Court of Tompkins County. 
He's the founding chairperson of the New York State Bar Association Judicial Wellness Committee, and he is a graduate of Cornell University and SUNY Buffalo School of Law. Mindy Thomas is the Family Treatment Court Coordinator in Tompkins County, serving 65 to 70 parents and their families who suffer from trauma and substance use disorders. She coordinates a collaborative team of 25 to 30 members to facilitate engagement and community resources for families. She has over 13 years of experience in family court, drug court, residential treatment, outpatient treatment centers, and empowering families to achieve their hopes, dreams, and goals. Representing Alameda County is Gavin O'Neill. He currently coordinates a number of collaborative treatment courts for the Superior Court of California, County of Alameda, including drug courts, reentry courts, veterans courts, and family drug courts. He has worked at the nexus of behavioral health and court systems since 19. 94 and led collaborative programs including residential treatment for people with co-occurring disorders, intensive case management programs, and sober high schools. He is active in his recovery community and has a personal history that informs his professional work. Excellent. For the Travis County team, Michelle Kimbrough is the services manager for the parenting and recovery Travis County Family Drug Treatment Court. She has worked for six years as a Child Protective Service caseworker and supervisor, during which time she was recognized for her outstanding work. She has a BA in Psychology and Masters of Science in Social Work from the University of Texas at Austin. Amber Middleton is the Parenting and Recovery Family Drug Treatment Court Coordinator and a licensed master's social work and licensed chemical dependency counselor. She chaired the EMDR International Association's membership committee. She has, uh, she has presented multiple times at the Texas Association of Specialty Courts annual conference on a variety of topics, including trauma and substance use disorders. She's a graduate of Tulane University and the Tulane School, University of, Uni School of Social Work. And lastly, is Judge Aurora Martinez-Jones, who was appointed Associate Judge in Travis County. She is a Child Welfare Law Specialist certified by the National Association of Counsel for Children with extensive experience working with parents suffering from drug and alcohol addiction. Currently, her judicial position is dedicated to child welfare dockets in Travis County, including the Specialty Family Drug Treatment Court. She is currently the chair-elect for the Texas Children's Justice Act Task Force, past president of the Austin Black Lawyers Association, former chair of the Austin Court Appointed Family Advocates, and she is on the board for the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges. So at this point, we'll turn the uh, presentation over to the Tompkins County team. Thank you. Uh, this is John Rowley. I'm with Mindy Thomas and um, really uh, pleased to be able to talk about uh, family treatment court generally and our own experience with it. Um, we do, uh, once I do my advancing of my slide, uh, we do want to start off with just a uh, brief uh, overview of the family treatment court model. Let's just down a little farther. There we go. Sorry. Um, I know that most of you uh, probably signed on to this because you have some connection to family treatment court. Um, but if you don't, um, the name is enough to get you started. This is similar to a lot of the other uh, drug treatment courts that are out there. But I think even bigger than that, what's important about family treatment court is, is some of uh, what it stands for because this model is applicable to a lot of other, uh, I think, social service um, problems and solutions uh, because it's based so heavily on the coordination of services. Um, it's uh, absolutely uh, a family-centered approach and it's uh, very much uh, dependent on, um, in this case, the leverage of the convening power of the court. So these are uh, typically courts that a, a judge takes the lead on, brings the community together, uh, develops a model, um, and now we're talking about uh, in New York State, for example, these are all neglect cases, these are all parents 
where substance abuse is alleged to have contributed to um, the neglect of their children. These are civil cases, not criminal cases, that of course affects very much uh, the way that we approach uh, any uh, sanctions or any other uh, responses. Um, in fact, uh, I might as well just say this at the outset, I think two important things, that the uh, July 1st they'll be rolling out uh, Children and Family Futures is uh, the National Technical Assistance Organization for Family Treatment Courts, and they are rolling out the eight standards for uh, family drug courts. Um, this is a big step forward for us, although we've been around for about 20 years. Uh, we've been kind of uh, uh, independent uh, operators, and, uh, for better or worse, because I think we've, we've learned a lot about the eight standards is an is a idea to uh, get us all in agreement on what is the essential uh, parts of a family treatment court. And that's really what we're going to focus on today because it really was uh, CFF and their work with us which um, changed the way we're doing business in Tompkins County. Although we've been in, in uh, operation for a long time, about 2013, 2014, we really got hit with the opiate epidemic. Our numbers doubled double from about 25 to 30 parents to 55 to 60 and even higher. And um, you know, it's uh, like any situation when the stress level goes up, the cracks really show. And um, we were missing a lot of, um, there was a lot of opportunities that we weren't taking advantage of just for really lack of knowledge, uh, lack of technical assistance. And uh, we were lucky enough to get uh, a grant that provided technical assistance from Children and Family Futures. And that resulted in what you see here now is the key components of our Family Treatment Court. This really reflects all of that uh, uh, assistance. Uh, the timely access to treatment, uh, the research is very strong uh, that early engagement is essential. Um, it's significantly related to uh, likelihood of treatment completion. In general, uh, the uh, drug courts, whether you're talking about the criminal or the family drug courts, um, we've demonstrated that uh, uh, the uh, amount of uh, engagement, the amount of support, the amount of supervision that's involved, that uh, most uh, addicted persons uh, will enjoy a period of sobriety or abstinence, and uh, that then gives them the opportunity to start dealing with all the other things that are uh, overwhelming them. Um, but uh, if, if your family treatment court, uh, for example, your case is coming into one judge and it languishes there for a month until they refer to the family treatment court judge, and, you know, and you're a couple months out before you hit treatment, um, we, uh, I think the research would be very clear that uh, you're going to be missing an opportunity. So we've been very much focused on uh, how quick can you do it, and uh, you know, it's the old warm handoff. We are now having our uh, treatment providers in the courtroom, and we're saying, yes, you need to get over to treatment, and the, and the person you're going to talk to is, is sitting right behind you. Go talk to them. The um, uh, coordinated use of evidence-based practices, I mean, this really ties with the, um, uh, the family focus here uh, because, um, and this is what the second point was that I never got to regarding the eight standards. The family treatment courts have struggled for a long time with standing apart from the criminal drug courts. And uh, it, 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 looking back on it, it it's a, uh, it was kind of that setup, right? We had criminal drug courts. We had a very clear model. We were focused on individuals. We were focused on adults or even on juveniles. We we're not focused on families. So we bring families in, and we're focusing on the parent because it's so much. They're who's in front of us, and they're the ones that we are uh, interacting with. Uh, this uh, eight, the uh, new standards and really the uh, key components that I'm talking about really represent, you know, maybe not a divorce, but we certainly have a separation uh, going on with the criminal drug court model. Uh, we are um, failing when we're, our focus is an individual parent. So our evidence-based practices now really help us engage families. There's some very, very solid programs out there. They're not necessarily uh, easy to come by or inexpensive, but they're very effective. We use the Strengthening Families. There's a similar version called Celebrating Families. And, and you really have to see this to understand it, but uh, to see it for us, uh, uh, these are families with children, uh, six or eight families meeting together, having a meal together, and then going off fam parents separate from their children, 
doing a, a standardized lesson, coming back together and practicing, um, really highly effective. And, and what we see from that is the connection that happened between the families. So uh, let me run through a couple of these uh, quickly so I don't take up uh, all of our time. We're using a safe care program. The nice thing about that is it's an in-home based program. We're using public health nurses to do this curriculum. So once again, we're talking about uh, having uh, skilled practitioners who are used to dealing, going into people's homes, going in and engaging parents uh, with uh, how to uh, either improve what's going on in their home or to uh, uh, provide assistance uh, as requested. Uh, we're very uh, committed to the child and parent psychotherapy uh, model, which is a, a huge commitment and one that we were just able to make. Um, peer supports is the other uh, piece that uh, many of you are familiar with now, but we are really just getting up to speed with that. And I mentioned that in particular because once again, we're talking about families, we're talking about uh, moving towards more in home care with greater flexibility and um, peer supports allow us to fill in those gaps. They're not in any, you know, they don't have a, a, a schedule for the day. Their schedule is what needs to be done. Um, I think you're really successful when parents are seeing our family treatment court team as their team. We're in this together. That's a lot to have accomplished. I think a, a great deal of our success comes from uh, the uh, solution focus that, uh, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just uh, learning my slide. Uh, there we go. The, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to have uh, Mindy talk about then the uh, solution-focused approach of the entire team because that really gets to how we engage parents uh, at the level where they could actually imagine a judge and a DSS attorney and other counsel as part of their team. Mindy? Yes, I think it's important to explain who is on our team. Um, to have a better picture of the dedication from our community partners and most importantly the Department of Social Services. Um, we have 11 members from the Department of Social Services on our team. We have two full-time attorneys representing our children along with a full-time social worker. We have three respondents attorneys. We have liaisons for our outpatient substance use disorder treatment along with mental health. Um, we have a liaison from our advocacy center, which is our domestic violence. And then um, it's the judge, myself, my case manager, and the judge's law clerk. So we have a very large team that um, is behind our families on a daily basis. And what we have um, every Tuesday is a case review. And that Tuesday is before our Wednesday court sessions that we have the case review. And it's very trauma-informed. Um, allowing us to focus on the children first and then that evolves focusing on the parents, the resource parents along with the children. And how case review is done is I call on the participant and then we go around the room and each member of our team provides an update and we focus on the children first by the caseworker providing an update on how the family is doing and then we have a children's resource coordinator and she is a she is employed by the Department of Social Services so she provides update on the children's services the three evidence-based programs the judge was talking about safe care strengthening families child parent psychotherapy so we get a thorough update on how they're doing in those programs and then I move on to the attorney for children who provides an update on the services our liaisons for treatment, advocacy center, the respondent's attorney, and then myself. And of course, the judge, judge intervenes anytime needed or wanted. Um, so this allows us to have an open dialogue on our families to have a better picture of what's going on. Um, what we utilize during the case review is apparent summaries, and these are come from our computer-generated program that I have through the court system and each member of the team has a copy of the parent summaries and this allows us to have current up-to-date notes from everybody on the team so we know what's going on and then our liaisons from the treatment agencies can take that back to the primaries that the families are working with whether it be with the children or the parents 
so they can have an integrated service plan to know exactly what's going on with each of the family uh, members. This is also allowing the participants or the children not to have to continue to re repeat their trauma and talk about their trauma with all the different resources in the community because we have that communication happening all right there at the same time. So it allows us to not have to repeat trauma over and over and over. We all are on the same page. We all understand what's going on and what the current, um, what's currently going on with the family. So the, uh, this turns into then uh, the court appearance the next day, and I think it's um, really important to uh, try to get a picture of how this has changed for us, um, because I think we're doing something that uh, feels very, um, very much uh, more effective and much more empowering than historically. So the, rather than the judge, me, and my elevated bench with a parent being called up to a podium with a microphone, because that is the scenario. These are parents talking to the judge. It's a very important part of the model. These are not lawyers talking to the judge for the parent. Lawyers are there, but they're not speaking. Um, and, and me saying to the parent, um, all right, so well, I see that you've missed uh, three appointments this week. What's going on? And, and how about this? You know, the warnings, the, you know, the, the subtle threats, the whatever it is. Um, that is completely out the window. We've been spending a lot of time um, around a trauma-informed solution-focused training, and of course we hear those terms all the time, but actually over time it is really affecting our behavior and our approach. Um, the more data you collect, the, the, the scarier it gets as to the history of our parents, how many of them were, were uh, raised uh, by non-parents, how many of them were in the foster care system, uh, the child sexual abuse. Um, I mean, those ACE scores are just through the roof over and over and over again. And we are tracking the ACE scores, the adverse uh, childhood experiences. So the, uh, a big focus of uh, trauma-informed, solution-focused um, is uh, the five uh, uh, principles um, that have to do with trustworthiness, safety, empowerment, collaboration, and choice. So if you think about those uh, terms and what they mean when it comes to a parent who's in the courtroom. Um, take the judge now, me, getting off the bench, coming down to the podium. We have the parents sitting out in the audience with their peers, and they can sit together with whoever they want to, including a peer support um, or other uh, parents that they uh, have a relationship with. They don't even have to stand anymore, and the conversation has completely changed. I am not. First of all, I'm not doing the bulk of the talking, at least when I'm doing it well. And, uh, and secondly, the focus is on um, really their agenda. What, what's, uh, what's on your uh, to-do list for today? What's on your mind? What's keeping you up at night? How can we support you? Um, and it becomes really a very therapeutic uh, interaction. There's no other way to describe it. I'll go ahead and put the... Uh, therapeutic uh, slide up there. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a remarkable thing to witness because what we have found now that everyone's gotten used to this change, which has probably been a year, year and a half now, is that we're getting much more candid conversations, but it's, it's also so relational. I mean, uh, these parents um, feel like we are on their side. They're, they're connected to us. They are setting the agenda. They feel safe. Um, we're demonstrating our trustworthiness. The empowerment happens because they are making choices. Um, the collaboration is because, you know, they'll, they'll ask about a question. I'll say, yes, this person's in charge of the housing. This person's in charge of that. Um, it, it's a very uh, potent and powerful uh, approach. It is challenging because we are um, essentially going from a, a sanction-based uh, model uh, to one that's just down to uh, really effective reinforcement of positive behaviors or uh, effective redirection um, for negative behaviors. Um, but it, it just, there's, there's no, no good comes from the shaming and the blaming and the uh, punishing that, that happens uh, inevitably by a judge taking a, a tone uh, with a parent. Um, if there has to be, um, I mean, it's not that we avoid hard conversations, 
but often those conversations best happen in the therapist's office, uh, in the counselor's office, or even in the uh, coordinator's office. Um, we, we've had a very uh, positive response uh, to these efforts. I, I'm really uh, pleased uh, with the buy-in from all of us. And uh, let me get to our last slide. This is what's um, come of our work. Um, we're looking at 2011 to 2013. This is kind of business as usual. 2014 to 2017, when Children and Family Futures were uh, showing us uh, how we could do things better, and then how we've sustained that from them. And uh, I have to say these are pretty remarkable numbers. It's easy to see the way the graduations have increased. Um, the relative custody is an interesting uh, component. Of course, it's what the, the feds would like to see us doing more and more, making use of our family resources. Um, the surrender number is, is really impressive. Um, when we were having 45% of our cases end with surrender um, down to 7% now. Now, now there's, you dig into these numbers, there's a lot, of, lot to this. You know, there are uh, custody resolutions of these cases. We've got a, a kinship program now in New York State. There's a variety of outcomes, but they result in uh, continuation of parental relationships with their children. So I'm going to... Um, Call it a day at that. I just about used up the time that I have, and um, I just put the slide up for uh, Alameda County. So that sounds like a good time for me to stop. Thank you. Gavin O'Neill from this is Gavin O'Neill from Alameda County. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. I'm the coordinator here. Um, that was great. I learned a lot. Um, just now from Tompkins County. Um, so let's see, I'm gonna run through some highlights of successful strategies that we've learned in our seven years of creating and growing the family drug courts. I would say <clears throat> to everyone out there that uh, this has been a process, not an event. We've learned a lot and made a lot of mistakes along the way. Um, in 2005, we got a little micro grant to start a pilot project, Family Drug Court. And the court was really siloed in their approach and didn't really um, partner that effectively with the other stakeholders and with social services. And that project um, was really rocky uh, as a result. In 2012, we won a SAMHSA grant. Um, and then we have continued to win them. Uh, we won another one in 2015 and another one in 2018 that have both expanded and enhanced our family treatment courts. And that's really where, uh, through the SAMHSA grants, is where our learning uh, really took off and where our partnerships really took off. Um, and as Judge Rowley was saying, um, we partnered with Children and Family Futures to provide technical assistance when we were first really trying to implement our family drug courts in accordance with best practices. Um, and getting that technical assistance was a game changer for us. Um, they uh, really came in and helped us understand uh, the points of view of all the different stakeholders and what the strengths and challenges would be there. So they were saying like, you know, these are, this is typically <clears throat> where the fears that parents' attorneys are gonna have about the family drug courts. And this is where social services is, could feel territorial. This is what you're gonna be kind of taking away from them or stepping into their wheelhouse. This is where, um, you know, the judges are gonna, are gonna um, have questions. And I really feel like all of that information was really useful. I mean, I, I, they kind of like gave us a cake recipe and said, if you follow this recipe on the back of this box, you will produce this cake and it will taste good. And, um, and we had been kind of experimenting with recipes before that, before we really understood how to bake uh, to extend the metaphor. And um, we had some funny looking cakes that were coming out of the oven. So they were right, that recipe worked and has continued to work. Um, they also helped us find an independent evaluator uh, that, was, that had a lot of experience evaluating uh, family drug courts in particular, but collaborative courts in general, that has also been extremely helpful. 
and they helped us, they really impressed upon us how important it was to set up a working steering committee with all the stakeholders and to meet really frequently and to create our policies by uh, a democratic process. Um, to really try to get buy-in on your policy and procedure manual at every step, including um, eligibility criteria and uh, discharge criteria, things like that. Um, and they also supplied examples of those things for us to look at. Uh, <clears throat> I think, you know, challenges, we continue to search for local sustainability opportunities using our positive evaluation results. Um, but um, that's been challenging. Uh, our court manages three family drug courts. There's one attached to each of our three dependency courts, uh, and that is what's called an integrated model, where you have the same judge that's hearing the dependency case is your family drug court judge if you're a parent. Um, having a parallel model would be if you had a different judge hearing your drug court case as your dependency case. In our experience, and we've tried both, um, the integrated model worked much better for us because um, there was just uh, way more buy-in from the parents. There was sort of a lack of understanding when it wasn't the judge that they really cared about um, that was hearing their drug court case. You know, well, why do I have to do this? And why do I have to do that? When it's the same judge, there's a giant sort of silent um, subtext to everything that's happening in the family drug court that is um, motivating for the parent. Um, let's see, so we've had a pretty significant, from the beginning, because of a lot of fears of the stakeholders, we had a pretty significant firewall between the drug court and the dependency case. I've heard a lot of things, including just from Tompkins County, about how they blur that or how they're they're addressing the needs of the children and stuff in court. That sounds really attractive. Um, our our uh, our court is very hyper vigilant about not discussing the children, not discussing visitation. They really want to focus on the parents' treatment uh, for addiction and mental health issues. Um, and but hopefully we're moving uh, forward with that. Um, drug court information gets over to the dependency case when the child welfare workers summarize our progress reports, our case managers' progress reports. Case managers are not subpoenaed into the dependency case, um, and that's been really helpful so that the drug court staff isn't um, in an adversarial role or, you know, choosing sides or something, or being used by one side or the other. Um, our progress reports are kind of like our testimony in the dependency case. Um, okay, so I want to get to another slide here. Um, so this is kind of cool. So. Um, the way that our, uh, we get referrals, um, our parents are eligible for our program in the first six months of their dependency case. Uh, we make every effort to get them in the program immediately, like you just heard from the other presenters. Um, the faster that you can get parents into the program, the better, and we are um, introducing ourselves to the parents at the first court appearance. So immediately after the removal, our staff are meeting the parents. And the way that that happens is we have court admin people, they're called legal processing assistants or LPAs, who read the detention reports. Um, and if they think that there's any kind of substance abuse or alcoholism that are a factor in the case, they will send an email to the case managers and say, hey, there's a family appearing in uh, their first hearing tomorrow, and you may want to meet them. And then my staff is in the courtroom ready to meet those parents. Um, parents, uh, to meet eligibility criteria, <clears throat> they have to have a high need 
for addiction and most likely mental health services. So 70% of our parents have co-occurring disorders. We use an ASAM and other screening to determine parents that are at a high risk to not be successful in the dependency case if it's just business as usual. If they just have a social worker and they're going through the dependency case, they aren't going to make it. They can't stop using. They, their mental health is uh, not stable. They're not taking their medication or whatever. Those are the parents that we're taking into the family drug court. Our case managers uh, are clinicians, so they're social workers and therapists. We hire high-level uh, clinical people, and um, hopefully with lived experience, we've hired our case managers have been drug court graduates, teen mothers that uh, have been addicted to drugs and then got sober. Um, we've just hired uh, p people that have worked in um, treatment programs for a decade, uh, a lot of people with a lot of different relevant experiences. Our case managers handle all the treatment and substance abuse issues. So they've taken that sort of from social services, and that was the agreement that we had in the beginning. So the social workers defer to our court staff, our case managers, for assessment, treatment placement, problem solving with the treatment programs, all drug testing, and all progress reporting to the courts on that. Our case managers, we have a lot of, we have a big county and we have a lot of different treatment programs. And so our case managers represent all the treatment programs in the court session. And they do that by having weekly contact with the uh, different treatment programs. Um, we have just coordinated standardized progress reporting across our county from all treatment providers so that all the reports from the treatment providers look the same, have the same information, and come to us at the same time. That's also been really helpful and avoids um, the case managers running around trying to hunt down reports from all these different staff people. Um, the, our case managers also coordinate the court session. They kind of produce it, um, the peer learning session. Um, while the judge is definitely the, the director, the case manager is kind of behind the scenes making sure that all the parts are happening. Um, and they facilitate strategies to engage the gallery of participants. We put a lot of energy into the peer learning aspect of the court. And so there's different things in the phases that try to um, get the gallery to participate. Like phase one people will come up and do the gift card drawing. and phase a phase two person at the start of court will stand up and give their tip of the day to everyone in the gallery about one thing they've learned in recovery that's helping them. And phase three participants will tell their story in court and things like that. Um, and the case managers kind of set all that up. Uh, we're fortunate, really fortunate, to have three residential programs and about three outpatient programs and a bunch of recovery residences that are designed to serve women with their children. So we have a lot of treatment options where children can be placed or participate with the parents while they're in treatment. One thing that's really cool about that is that um, our judges trust the process so much, our dependency judges, that if a parent's in the family drug court and are placed into one of these residential treatment programs, more often than not, the judge will allow the child to be placed with the parent in that residential program, which allows the children to remain in home during the dependency case. Um, our median time to get parents into treatment from the point where, where we meet them at that first court appearance is two days. So just like the judge before was talking about having the treatment programs in court saying, and there's your treatment program right across the aisle. Um, we don't have it that together, but we are driving people to treatment the day of their first court hearing or the next day. Um, so that's really good. Uh, so our parents, Let's see, so they're drug testing twice a week. We have, we have incentives, we really don't have sanctions. Um, 
we're not quite as structured as what you heard before about um, having like a theory around um, trauma-informed responses to behavior, but we've definitely like organically figured out that encouragement and um, problem solving and therapeutic responses to behavior uh, are much more effective in the family drug courts and actually in the criminal drug courts too, but that's a different story um, than sanctioning the parents in the family drug court. We have a lot of incentives. There's incentives that um, we're fortunate enough through our county uh, behavioral health department provides some gift cards so that every parent can get a gift card at every court session if they are in treatment and testing negative um, for drugs and alcohol. And the amount of money on that gift card goes up with the phase system. Um, we had a group of parents that were recent graduates or about to graduate that got together and petitioned the court to start an alumni group, They, which is pretty incredible if you think about it. Um, that's a group of parents that were asking the court to stay court involved past the point when they needed to, when their commitment to the drug court and the dependency court were up. Um, and that uh, is a pretty amazing group of, um, of parents, and we really try to invest in that group and support that group in a lot of different ways. Um, our team, our family drug court team, includes the judge and uh, representatives from so the social services agency, county council, or their, the, the workers' attorneys, um, both parents and children's attorney groups are present at every court session. Um, the SATS is our case manager, so our case manager, um, and we have a mental health coordinator too that helps get parents their mental health stuff. Uh, we have a really active steering committee that meets quarterly and problem solves and creates policy. Um, it's, there's like, I don't know, 40 people that come. Our treatment programs come. All the judges and stakeholders come. It's really big, and we provide lunch for everyone, which I would say never underestimate the power of a pizza in a collaborative. Um, that we pay for through our county behavioral health department. And uh, the family drug courts have the most stakeholder engagement, for sure, of any of our collaborative courts. Um, so I've talked a little bit about that weakness before. Um, so then our newest sort of like thing that we're doing is we we saw that and and the, the and Tompkins County talked about this too on our parents um, case plan with social services they have to complete an evidence based parenting curriculum and our county is really large and. The parenting curriculum is only delivered at one or two sites. And so a lot of our parents, right as they're getting to the end of their case, they're not completing that parenting curriculum. And so we decided in our last SAMHSA grant proposal to partner with uh, Celebrating Families, which is an evidence-based parenting curriculum, and our residential programs agreed to implement that parenting curriculum on site. So you have the parent there with their kid in treatment or children in treatment with them and it's a totally missed opportunity to go through that parenting curriculum. We really liked celebrating families because it included the children um, in the, in the uh, curriculum. And so we're evaluating that system and tracking that system. Um, and our evaluator is partnering with the actual program developers of Celebrating Families to evaluate some modifications that we made to the program. So we shortened the time frame of the program to match our county's maximum time allowed in residential treatment. And also, it was a cohort model where you could the group that started the, the, um, the sessions all had to kind of finish the sessions together before someone else could start, and that really wasn't ideal for us. And so we had them adapt the curriculum to allow for new clients or parents to be able to enter the curriculum at any point 
and then round it out. And so our evaluator is working with them to see um, how that's working. Um, so data sharing has been a challenge with social services, I would say, but we've also made unprecedented progress with social services. They're, they're not really giving us case level data, but they are giving us a lot of good data on the aggregate. I mean, we collect a lot of data too, but, um, but it's really important to look at the data once the client leaves the family drug court. Um, and so you want to look at, um, you want to look at obviously reunifications, recurrences of maltreatment, if anyone uh, gets children taken away from them again after graduating the program. One thing that I would say the most important part for us that we started with was to get social services to agree to flag the family drug court participants in their MIS system. So they created a special code where they could tag everyone that went through the family drug court. Because then even if you don't have all your agreements worked out and understood, you can go back years later and find the participants if you need to. The most important thing is getting them identified in social services database, in my opinion. And then um, I think uh, our evaluator, so I would say that other having an evaluator has been really valuable and it's been, I, I think the main benefits of it from my point of view as the coordinator is that evaluation has been key in writing competitive grant proposals. So we're reunifying families, our graduates are reunifying at 90% with um, very low recurrences of uh, CPS involvement after graduation, maybe like 6%. And so far, zero um, removals after graduation. That data is uh, really impressive and it's been really key to us continuing to win competitive grants. Also, our evaluator gives our work group information on racial disparities in the program and other red line problems that the group needs to immediately address and take a look at. Our evaluator helps us tell our story to potential funding sources and also our evaluator has been key in partnering with social services on our data sharing. Um, that's all that I have right now and I hope that that was helpful um, and I'm going to turn it over to the next presenter. Hello. Um, thank you very much. This is Michelle Kimbrough with the Parenting and Recovery Program in Travis County. Um, we are going to talk to you today a little bit about um, our child uh, services program and also how we endeavor to keep parents with their children for the duration of the program, if that's at all possible. First of all, we do have an abbreviation key because we just kind of have an alphabet soup uh, in our presentation, so we wanted to kind of give you an idea of some of the assessments that we use and then also some of the common child welfare terms and the child welfare law terms um, that I'll, we might be using throughout this presentation. To give you a little bit of a background, our program was originally conceived of with a working community collaboration in 2006, and we actually had our first docket in March of 2008, so we've been around about 11 years. We now are funded through a combination of local funding through Travis County, and then also we have a SAMHSA grant to expand treatment capacity for family drug courts. That grant pays for primarily substance abuse treatment, uh, trauma therapies, peer recovery coaching services, and some of our um, support services. We have also in the past had a regional partnership grant, RPG grant from um, uh, 
the federal government. We've also had um, an OJJDP grant, Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention grant in the past. Um, we have worked diligently on strategic planning and sustainability. Um, can't emphasize enough how important it is to always be thinking a few years in the future as to where your funding is going to be coming from. One of the things that was really helpful was when we originally created a charter in 2010 where we very clearly stated our mission, our vision, uh, collective values for those in our collaboration and all significant partners actually signed that charter. It was also what established the governing bodies, which we have too. We have an operations committee, which is kind of like a steering committee that meets every other month. And we have an advisory committee, which is more like a strategic planning committee. Um, it is you, made up of the heads of uh, some of the agencies that we work with. And they are kind of more of the oversight, um, the big picture people, and they meet uh, once a quarter. Okay, um, for participants to get into our program, uh, they must have a child age zero to five. We thought it was important from the very beginning to focus on young children um, and to be able to intervene as early as possible when they are in the primary stage of brain development. We also require that the parents actually have a substance use disorder. Many of the referrals that we get originate from a parent that has delivered a drug positive um, infant or who was positive at the time of the delivery. I'd say that's just roughly a little bit over half. We also get referrals where um, a mother or father might be uh, driving while intoxicated and there would be a child in the car or there might be a domestic violence incident, law enforcement comes out and there is a toddler or a child in the home. Um, another requirement for our program, because we do uh, do what's something that's called court-ordered services. What that means is that CPS does not ask for custody of the children, uh, what we call TMC, Temporary Managing Conservatorship. All of the cases involve uh, just the court ordering the parents mm -hmm. to do the drug court program and to do the services. Um, and for that reason, because sometimes there is a wait to get into treatment, they do have to have a child safety placement um, so that there is a family member or a fictive kin um, where the child can be placed and supervised until the parent can actually get into treatment, which we try to do as soon as possible. Also, all parents have to voluntarily agree to the program, which is a 12 to 18 month program, and they are required to have consultation with an attorney um, with all of the good, bad, and the ugly reasons uh, for joining the drug court program before they actually sign on. What happens when a case comes to drug court is that someone calls in a referral to the CPS hotline. Um, that referral, if it's a child age zero to five um, and it's substance use involvement, uh, goes to a special drug court unit. This has been very, very helpful because those workers are very educated on our program. They're educated on substance abuse. Um, and they can provide information on the program from the time they come out to the scene. Um, at that time, they initiate what's called a family team meeting. That is a part of the family group decision-making model, which is an evidence-based model. If you go to the California evidence-based uh, clearinghouse, uh, child welfare programs, that is on there as a promising practice. Um, if the parent is open, uh, to the program, that family team meeting is held. I am invited to the family team meeting as the services manager, and we also have a peer recovery coach that comes to that family team meeting to begin providing support to the parent until they can get into treatment. Then we tell the parent there's three things that have got to happen for you to get in. You've got to observe a drug court docket, see what it's about, hopefully meet some of the other participants in the program, see the judge, uh, kind of get an idea of what you would be agreeing to. Uh, we have the parent advised by an attorney uh, after the petition is filed by CPS. 
and you know, hopefully very early on, even sometimes before the petition is filed, if there's not much of a wait list, the parent would go into treatment, the mother would, with their child age zero to five. Our primary treatment partner is Austin Recovery here in Austin, um, and they have a family house program for 90 days where mom and child can be in treatment together. There are times that if the wait list is too long or if a parent has two children under age five, we would be going to another treatment facility out of town. Uh, Santa Maria Hostel in Houston have been utilized, um, other treatment facilities in Texas. Um, we think it is really important to get moms and babies into treatment together. We also accept fathers into our program. Unfortunately, we don't have a way for fathers to go into treatment together with their children. Um, however, Austin Recovery has told us in the past they might, I, I stress might, uh, you know, if the situation were um, appropriate, uh, be willing to think outside the box if it were a father coming in with a child. Um, this model is heavily researched and has a lot of um, promise and uh, research behind it. Um, they have determined that when mothers and children go into treatment together, the mothers end up staying in treatment longer, which also uh, predicts their success in a child welfare suit. Um, their clinical outcomes improve. Um, in other words, their uh, substance use uh, declines. Um, their parenting skills improve because most of these family house programs actually have the ability um, to provide parenting training through the Nurturing Parenting Program, which is evidence-based, um, and they also have uh, child programs on site. Uh, for example, Austin Recovery has a daycare center. Um, and what they've also determined is it's completely invaluable for the children, uh, particularly children aged zero to five that need that bonding with a sober mom. Uh, so there's the incredible behavioral and uh, developmental benefits to the children. This is Aurora Martinez-Jones. I'm the presiding judge over the Family Drug Treatment Court here in Austin, Texas. And so as the judge and thinking about the legal case, one of the things that we always keep into consideration is although we're providing a lot of robust services and supports in a system where a parent is able to keep their child with them while they go through recovery and their treatment process, we're always, always balancing child safety. We have measures in place through the way our program is set up that we believe ensures that safety on a more thorough level. We have a strong partnership and agreements with our treatment providers and a lot of our partners who are at the table. So there is much more oversight for these parents, even though they do have their children with them. They are in a residential treatment facility and we're getting weekly updates on how things are going and progressing. Those treatment facilities are also keeping good communication with the other child advocates on the case so that if something does come up and there needs to be some immediate support or immediate intervention to assure the safety of the child, Folks are informed about that um, as soon as possible and able to act and assure that the child is going to be safe. We have an attorney ad litem who is always appointed on our cases for our children in the case, and they are a part of the team as well. We also have court-appointed specialty advocates. Those are our CASA program, our guardian ad litems for the court. The children in our program have CASAs as well, and those CASAs are a part of our um, treatment team um, and program team as well. So we have the child advocates as a part of the drug court team who attend the weekly staffings on the cases, so they're well informed about what's going on. Our weekly staffings in include reports about how progress is going in treatment and any other needs that we need to address, even as it relates to the children. We assure that we have the family included when we have family team meetings and family group conferences, and we assure that those are scheduled regularly for all of our cases. In some of my other cases that are not specific to the drug court, those things are not scheduled as uh, rigorously and regularly as they are with the drug court program. And with so many team members there, having family um, engage in those types of meetings has shown to be helpful in providing additional family support and making sure the family's voice and their concerns and their needs are also met. 
we have the expectation that we're going to be communicating with each other. We're going to be um, building trust in a rapport so that we can really feel like we are um, doing what's in the best interest of the children as we work through the program with the parents. Through our Parenting in Recovery program, we have some additional supports that don't always come along with the cases that are not in drug court, which is what makes our program very unique and um, makes it very advantageous for people to join the program. I know when the attorneys are advising those parents about whether or not it's an appropriate fit, um, they do highlight some of the additional supports that the parents in the program will get. That includes the substance use disorder treatment. Our program has um, partnerships with our treatment facilities to help fast track our parents getting into treatment, which can be a problem with parents who don't have that kind of um, support system or mechanism to put in place. Um, so we get them into treatment a lot quicker than they would be able to get otherwise. We also have dedicated child and family therapists for our drug court program that work with all of the children of the participants. They do assessments and provide services for those children. Um, and we have other wraparound support services and gap funding to make sure that all of the family's needs are being met so the parents can be as successful as possible um, through their journey in recovery. We also support parents through housing with um, recovery housing or sober housing for uh, about three months after they leave their inpatient treatment. Most of our parents who take their children with them into treatment are there for about 90 days, and then they get an additional 90 days of um, this sober housing that is paid for through the program. We also have uh, close partnerships to provide mental health services for our parents, especially in emergency, urgent situations. We do have an agreement so that they can um, get psych psychiatric assistance and medications provided. We also have a partnership with our local domestic violence uh, advocates. So we have those support services available as well, and they are partners on our team. And we also help with education, employment, parenting, and we do also have a partner who is a peer recovery coaching partner, and all of our parents are able to get that service as well. With getting all of those additional supports and um, things that are going to be very helpful, we also are very diligent about assuring the accountability and a lot of structure through our program. Um, great rewards, but also great accountability, and that is what we've seen to show fidelity and success for our parents. Our hearings are usually um, weekly at the beginning. I am both in the staffing and I'm the one having one-on-one -on -one conversations with the parents um, each week, and we're building a relationship. I tell them from the beginning that I know that trust is earned, and I'm starting with them on a clean slate. Despite whatever may have been allegations, I'm going to work with them and trust them until I have reasons not to, um, or I see behaviors that show me I shouldn't trust them. And that has been really successful in building that relationship, and I try and stay transparent with them and what they should expect to see happen, even when we have situations where there may be a lapse. I like for them to know what can happen next so that they are informed, and that is a trauma-informed approach in working with our parents, who we all know have experienced trauma. Um, we do have our um, staffings and case management happening outside of those hearings so that everybody is prepared for what will happen in the hearings. We have four phases in our program, and our first phase comes weekly. The second phase will come uh, every other week, the third phase every third week, and then, of course, our fourth phase will come monthly. We provide incentives and sanctions for the behaviors that we see and re we review, and those things are all discussed in our staffings before our hearings. We do have um, very specific criteria in order for our parents to graduate the program or if they're not successful in our program um, and, and we have some very specific things that we look at that would be considered if that were going to be a decision made. But for our graduations, we do things like graduation pro projects that they choose so that they can um, add to the program and benefit the other participants in the program. Um, and we have a lot of re recovery-related activities and 12-step um, recovery meetings that we have required of them. We um, have them write about their experiences in those meetings as proof of attendance. So we're not just relying on somebody at a meeting signing off saying that they did do it, um, but that we're actually seeing that they're gaining something from the experience. Uh, we have a very specific policy on any prescription drugs that may be used because we do want to make sure they're accountable for their recovery and what they put into their bodies and not 
allowing a doctor to prescribe them something that could be harmful to their recovery. We do also a drug testing uh, through a call-in system so they all know that they have a specific color and that helps us keep the um, fidelity with random uh, regular drug testing so we can assure that they're maintaining their sobriety. And so our program has been around for over 10 years and we have evolved as we've grown and learned more about what works well and what could work better. Originally we were designed to look at children from zero to five because we did have some specific grant funding that um, kept that in place. We still keep that model for the most part, but do not dis, uh, disqualify anybody just because they have older children. Um, we also had gotten grant funding through our evolution that allowed us to fund our child and family therapists, which has been very key and crucial to making sure that we keep a focus on family and a focus on children, even though we're working primarily with parents in the um, program. And with additional grant funding, we have continued to make sure that we have a very specific um, attorney ad litem. We have a, a public defender's office for children, the Office of Child Representation, and they are the primary partner who takes the appointments for the uh, representation of the children in the program. And we continue to make sure that we have all the assessments and services and supports for those children, additional services that may come up. So those child and family therapists have been a really um, important and integral part of our program team and have helped us continue to grow the way in which we serve the children as well as the parents. Hi, I'm Amber Middleton. I am the coordinator for the Parenting and Recovery Program, and I'm going to speak a bit on our child and family therapists. Um, <clears throat> so we are a very large, very robust team. We have... Uh, so many community partners and so every week we meet before the docket and um, discuss each case and so a really key voice in that conversation are our child and family therapists. Um, they assess all the children within 30 days of enrollment and that gives us the ability to ensure that the interventions we're using with the children and with the families, um, these are, interventions are effective. We use the ASQ, Ages and Stages Questionnaire, the ASQSE, which is the Ages and Stages Questionnaire Social-Emotional, and the AAPI, which is the Adult Adolescent Parenting Inventory. They develop treatment goals with the child and the family. They support children in their homes and community settings to promote successful behavior change and development. More often than not, our child and family therapists, we have two, will either meet with the children and the families on um, in, at, in their homes or they will meet um, at school. So the children are always engaged in an environment in which they feel comfortable. This, um, they promote healthy attachment and relationship with primary caregivers. They support caregivers' ability to meet the child's needs. And they share information with the team in weekly court staffings and biweekly case management meetings. And this helps us to address the common struggle in so many parenting uh, family drug treatment courts that um, you always hear that the children are left behind and the needs of the children can be left behind because there's so much focus on recovery in the parents. And so having two members of the team that have a very, very strong connection to the children allows us to ensure that the children are placed at the forefront of our services. They provide a variety of therapy services. This is just a very small snapshot of what they provide. Um, they engage with, they use the trust-based relational intervention. It was developed by the TCU Karen Purvis Institute of Child Development. They also are trained in EMDR, um, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, which is a trauma-specific intervention. You'll hear a lot about trauma-informed, but trauma-specific interventions not only take trauma into account, but are interventions that were created to directly address trauma and to help the individual resolve the impacts that trauma has had in their brains and in their lives. They use trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, child-parent psychotherapy, which you heard about earlier from another court, play therapy, family therapy, parenting and child development, psychoeducation, nurturing parenting skills training, 
um, and a list that goes on and on. Um, our two Tom family therapists are immensely qualified, highly, highly trained. Um, they have a very, very, very large tool bag from which to use um, depending on the family, depending on the needs of the parent, depending on the needs of the children. Um, they work on enhancing parenting time, moving towards best practices. Uh, in our program, parenting time and visits are never used as a reward or a punishment. Um, they're viewed as a right of the child. Um, we've Research shows a minimum of twice weekly in the event that visitation is necessary, um, twice weekly is what is recommended for positive psychological and behavioral changes in both the parents and the children. It is therapeutically facilitated. Parents practice new ways of interacting with the children with that safe, steady hand of a therapist to guide, to look for support, to look for confirmation, and to give our parents um, everything they possibly can, every tool they can possibly have to have strong, healthy relationships with their children. Um, there's also parenting coaching, individual therapeutic parenting coaching using NPP, the Nurturing Parenting Program. And then we have provided lactation consultation, um, developmental therapy evaluation, infant massage, um, equine therapy, art therapy, recreational therapy. We have also um, been able to um, help with enrichment activities such as martial arts, dance, gymnastics, summer camps. Most of our children right now are in a variety of summer camps, swim classes, you name it. Any camp that's available, we have tried to find a way to get our children um, the opportunity to participate. They also participate in pro-social skills groups, tutoring, and mentoring. So this is Judge Martinez Jones again. Um, when we look at how our program works and whether we can show that the way we do it is best, we feel very strongly about um, the data that we've seen from the way that we run our program. Um, in fiscal year 17, we served 67 parents and 84 children. So 61% of those children were infants under the age of two. And by the end of the CPS lawsuit, that's our, our state agency, um, we had 73% of all of their children with a parent, and 95% of children of our graduates were with a parent. Um, aside from that, it is primarily uh, family members if they're not with a parent and how our cases are resolved. We have 95% of parents successfully completed residential treatment, which that has shown us to be a huge step in future um, success. Um, d despite how things uh, resolve with the legal case. And we have an average of 98 days in treatment that our parents have spent while in the program. Throughout the case, we have uh, had 52% uh, of children that remained with their parents and 88% of children demonstrated improvement on those assessments, which we think is uh, showing a really strong outcome with the way that we're doing it. 71% of our parents have also had improved scores on their parenting assessment, and we have had 100% of any um, of children uh, that had health insurance and a primary care physician at the time of discharge. So those are some of the data outputs that we had that show that we believe what we're doing is um, a, a good step in the right direction and, and showing very good outcomes, especially as compared to some of our other courts in our state. So we're very happy to see that and we'll continue to work and make sure that we're taking care of the needs of the children. And that is what we have and uh, happy to answer questions for people who wanna reach out to us directly. Okay, well, thank you very much. That was a lot of information. Uh, to, to take in, and we have some, some very good questions. I thought the presentations were very thorough and provided, I think, a lot of stimulation to the participants on this webinar. So um, let me start with uh, a couple of the questions that came in, and the first, uh, first questions had to do with the Tompkins County program. So one of the, uh, so the question was, are, is your court open to the public? All family court in New York State is presumptively open. 
the only problem we ever run into are really with uh, alleged abusive partners who sometimes are going in to uh, collect information on uh, a parent. And uh, I do have the discretion to order people out of the courtroom, but the short answer is yes. Okay, thank you. And then also to Tompkins County, uh, and this came from the Little Trevor's Band of Odawa Indians in Michigan. Um, they'd like a visit. <laughs> and who should they contact? You know, it's uh, it's funny. Uh, we've been getting popular lately. I, I'm, it's, my head is swelling. Um, Mindy <laughs> Thomas is our uh, travel coordinator. We are doing a lot of visits. We, we really, you know, this is service. This call is service. All of our work that all of us are doing is service, and so uh, we consider it an obligation. We'll be happy to set something up. Oh, thank you very much, Judge. Very generous. Um, and so moving to um, the Alameda County uh, presentation, Gavin, uh, one, of our one of our participants wanted to know if, um, if you specify a minimum American Society of Addiction medicine treatment level in order for a client to be admitted into the program. Yes, um, they have to meet, uh, they have to re require intensive outpatient treatment. So over nine hours a week. Okay, that's, that's very helpful. And then um, following up, Gavin, uh, how do you collect your data? And yeah, so we've, we've just won a, a, a local grant to try to, um, to put together an MIS system. It's challenging. We do it all on Excel spreadsheets, and the case managers uh -huh. keep a ton of data, uh, and it is um, not an easy process. There's so much to collect, um, especially if you're being accountable to grant funders um, as well. Correct. So, yeah, it's challenging. And uh, I forget which of the presentation mentioned about the value of an evaluation of an evaluator. Do you, you have an evaluator connected to your program, or is it your treatment staff collecting your data? We have an evaluator, and he helps with a lot of the data, but the treatment staff have to maintain a daily spreadsheet. Okay, thank you. Um, just picking out the next question here. Um, so I, I have a, uh, just a question that I was wondering about for both the um, Travis County team and for the Alameda. And, and so I'll ask you, Travis, the Travis County team to answer first. Um, has the opioid crisis uh, increased demand for services in, in your courtrooms? Well, I mean, the short answer is that absolutely we have seen a lot more opiate addiction than we did in past years. And we also, for the past two years, have been utilizing medication-assisted treatment much more regularly. In fact, um, there have been very few um, clients with opiate use disorder that are not on medication-assisted treatment, and we found that to be very, very helpful. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. That was the other question about the availability of, of MAT, you know, to, to participants. So thank you for that. And so, and Gavin, how about uh, in Alameda? No, we're seeing a little bit of rise in opioid addiction, but uh, California and the Bay Area is, has been in a long methamphetamine um, crisis, uh, and the overdoses are not as prevalent, and so it's not as high profile in the news, but um, methamphetamine is just a, a monster here. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So this, this question is for the Travis County team again. With keeping kids with parents during treatment, what happens when a relapse happens? So this is uh, Judge Martinez-Jones. 
One of the things we utilize is some of our legal tools, and we have um, what we call a Rule 11 agreement. Uh, basically, one of our civil procedure rules allows us all to make agreements that can be utilized when necessary. And so we talk with our um, families ahead of time about who they would want designated as a person to take care of their child in, uh, in any kind of circumstance where they're not available. That's the first thing we go to is utilizing that person in the instance of a relapse um, just to assure that the parent is safe and that the child is safe uh, so that we don't have to do a removal. Um, if it, there isn't a person or um, it does get to a safety concern, then there may need to be a removal, and we do that. But in our court, the practice isn't that a relapse automatically leads to a removal of the child. Okay. Um, so same question to uh, the Tompkins County team, and then, I'll, and then I'll get to you, Gavin. Well, I, I would say that this is a place where um, we've seen our greatest shift over the last five years where a uh, – a relapse would be an automatic a removal. Um, automatic is a strong word, but you know, it's very likely. And uh, we have been working uh, harder and harder to shift our focus from the risk to the safety factors, the protective factors. Uh, it, a lot has to do with what the in-home services that are available. Um, but we are, uh, and also this mindset, and it's not necessarily universally accepted, of, of a lapse versus a relapse. You know, somebody who tests positive, admits to use, and recommits is different than somebody who uh, is using, who's hiding, whose behaviors all come back. And so um, we are uh, really going to rather extraordinary lengths to keep uh, kids at home, even in the face uh, of relapse. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a tricky business, but all of this is tricky business. But um, I think overall, it's proven to be a, a successful approach. Thank you, Charge. And uh, Gavin Alameda's county's approach to that. To yeah, I would just I would reiterate what uh, the other two presenters just said. We have this. We are going down that same road, um, and have from the beginning. I think the only thing I would add is that our social services department has spoken at length about how the family drug court, the existence of the family drug courts has changed the way that they have viewed relapse across the dependency system and with all of the workers where it's not an immediate removal quarantine situation where they're really looking at relapse on a case-by-case -case basis and what is the behavior around the relapse? Is that endangering the child or not? Okay, thank you. Um, I almost hesitate to ask this question, but uh, to the counties, but with 42 CFR, HIPAA, privacy confidentiality laws that vary across the states. Um, what are your arrangements for sharing information with your multiple partners? So let me start with uh, Travis County, and uh, then I'll move through the other ones. Well, the short answer is that we have developed pretty sophisticated releases of information. Um, every, every participant in our program signed release information that allows information exchange among everyone that's in the staffings each week, uh, including our substance abuse treatment partner. And then, you know, each individual provider treatment center, et cetera, will then get their own individual release of information. Um, and so it's really just navigating those releases has been have the you, challenge for us, but we have, we have managed to make it work. Yeah. So have you experimented with a universal consent form that all the agencies would agree to? Or? Well, there is there is one that is for all of the agencies that are involved in the staffing yeah. that is signed in the beginning. Um, yeah. But I think particularly for treatment centers, then they want them to sign their own when they get there yeah. and things like that. So okay. I can arrange for treatment with the treatment facility to try to get the person in, but then once they're in, they do sign the agency's own consent form. Okay. Um, Tompkins County? Same question. Hi, this is Mindy. Yes, we pretty much have the same thing. I have a separate release for each agency we use, but all of our releases have multiple parties on them as well, just to be sure. Uh -huh. um, another thing we do is we do send encrypted emails 
to ensure confidentiality that way too because a lot of our communication is done by email. So our emails are sent in encrypted so that they're the information is protected that way as well. Okay, yeah, that's an important head-on, I think. Um, and Gavin Alameda? Yeah, same here. We just have good release forms. Um, we tell the clients what we are and are not going to share. We're not going to get into the details of their therapy or anything like that, but um, their progress in treatment and their drug use is going to be shared with everyone, and it's going to make it to the dependency case. Okay. Um, so the last question that we'll take uh, before we wrap up is from Derek Smith. We are in the process of starting a family treatment court. Do any of you charge a fee for participating? And if so, how much our adult treatment court charges a fee to help pay for incentives as we are a small county with limited funding? So um, start with uh, Tompkins County on, on the fee issue. Yeah, so we don't charge any fee, but I, I can appreciate the dilemma. Um, we've got uh, strict ethic rulings now that we can't, as a court, solicit anything um, that would help us with our incentives, which really makes it challenging. Um, it's all about creativity and uh, trying not to have uh, the judge uh, uh, reach into their wallet every week. So um, <laughs> I, I don't mind, but my staff doesn't like it. Um, it's very challenging. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Alameda County? Well, we don't. We, we, we try to bend over backwards so that there's absolutely no charge for anything for the participants, transportation, drug testing, anything. But, um, but we have the funds to be able to do that so far. Um, I mean, I think you have to do what you have to do. Okay. Thank you. And then Travis County. Yes, uh, so we don't charge any fees to our participants either, and uh, we do our best with uh, especially our grant funding. That's one of the things we rely on heavily to make sure we have everything covered and supported. But we do also have that advisory committee that's made up of kind of higher level community support and partners. And if we have certain needs, we do take it to that advisory committee. As a judge, I cannot ask specifically for things. Um, and so that advisory committee can just be made aware of the needs of the court, and they can then, on behalf of us, ask for anything or provide things that we might need, things for like our fishbowl or incentives or things like that. But it is a difficult thing that we do struggle with from time to time, making sure that we do have funding from some of, for some of those kinds of things. Um, and so we, we try and make sure we have good partnerships with folks who can provide those for us. Okay, well, thank you very much, Judge. And that, that wraps up uh, the webinar. Um, if uh, any of you are interested, uh, who are partic uh, participants on the webinar, uh, in joining the GAINS listserv, you can use this link uh, to, so that you will get copies of our newsletters and, um, and other announcements related to uh, justice behavioral health work. Uh, the slides will be going out to participants uh, at the conclusion of the webinar. There have been a number of requests and questions specific to the specific sites regarding data, visits, um, sharing of, of information. Uh, and uh, for the participants on the webinar, we suggest that you contact those sites um, directly. They've all given you their um, their contact information. So uh, if there are is a request for additional questions or other information from those sites, um, they, uh, the sites will respond to those. They've been very generous with their time and preparation for this webinar. Their, their uh, presentations were all very, very thorough and informative. So on behalf of SAMHSA and the Gaines Center, uh, this webinar comes to a close. Thanks again to all our participants.